heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow, he's off. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Twitter becomes X. Elon Musk makes some overnight changes to the look of the social network. What's the vision for the company we discuss? Plus, Apple planning to keep shipments steady for the latest iPhone 15. We'll break down why the company is still so confident, with 85 million being targeted despite the decline in the smartphone market. And Sam Altman's other project, WorldCoin, soars on the first day of trading. We'll dig into the details of the token and the project from the OpenAI CEO. But first, let's check in in the broader markets. And while some pretty downbeat economic data globally, Abigail did a little. Uh, there certainly is, especially uh, in Germany, pretty shocking and maybe suggesting that maybe some sort of a global economic slowdown could be ahead. But here in the U.S., we do have the S&P 500 climbing for a second day. Uh, what makes this interesting is the fact that you have the SIBO VIX, that volatility index, also higher. Typically, when stocks go higher, that goes lower. So it suggests that maybe in this week, as big tech earnings really kick off in earnest, that we could have some fireworks ahead. Now, one stock that's doing really quite well today, uh, Apple, of course, on this report that the company uh, has ordered enough parts to think that they are going to be, they're basically holding their iPhone shipment plan for this year of 85 million units flat to last year. The stock being higher suggests that investors may be relieved that it's flat, that it's not a decline. As for the year, well, it's been all about this big tech rally. Uh, the first half was the best half on record. Right now, that NASDAQ 100 up 41% on the year. It's only July. This earnings season, though, Caroline, it's going to be a real nail biter. We, of course, uh, to Tomorrow we have uh, Microsoft and Alphabet. On Wednesday we have Meta. Uh, so lots and lots of stocks uh, moving to the upside and the downside. Meta, it's interesting just to note that at this point off of its lows, but down about eight tenths of one percent. That's going to be a big one, Caroline. As you know, on Wednesday everybody looking for the year of efficiency, uh, their new uh, uh, p uh, Twitter competition. Plus, the stock last week up 150% on the year. Will the numbers justify it? Something to keep in mind. It's still a mid-single-digit growth number that they're looking for. It's going to be an interesting report for sure. Yeah, and are we going to be calling it Twitter for that much longer? Certainly not calling to Elon Musk. Let's get back to what Abigail was just starting with, though. Apple, biggest points contributor to the S&P today. Let's talk about why. I'm very pleased to say Mark Gurman's here. With the latest reports, according to people familiar, that they are sticking to 85 million as their target for sales for the iPhone 15, which actually is pretty resilient if you think about the economy. That's right. So 85 million units flat uh, through the rest of the year for these next generation iPhones, four new models, two new iPhone 15 Pro models, uh, two standard iPhone 15 models. That means that the shipments that Apple's targeting are going to be flat for the third year uh, in a row. Now, that's pretty good given everything going on economically. If you look at the Android uh, market for smartphones, if you look at the larger consumer electronics market, uh, flat is a good thing. Now, but let's give some context, some comparison here, right? Uh, the last two iPhone models, the iPhone 13 line and the iPhone 14 line, uh, those were pretty basic upgrades, not a lot new there, right? But the iPhone 15 Pro models, uh, as well as the lower-end iPhone 15 models, they're actually going to be uh, quite significant upgrades. They're going to have a redesign on the high end. They're going to be switching from stainless steel to titanium. They're going to be changing the charger from Lightning to USB-C, uh, which is the industry standard. Uh, you're going to see the dynamic island, that feature you're showing right now on TV, on the lower end iPhone 15 models, big camera upgrades on both, uh, even a bigger upgrade, particularly for zooming in on photos and videos on the highest end iPhone, the 15 Pro Max. Uh, you may see a little bit of a price increase internationally across the four models. So big iPhone upgrades this year. Well, flat, in my opinion, it's a little bit more nuanced. Mm -hmm. uh, it's flat in a major iPhone upgrade cycle. All things considered, still fairly positive, though. Mark, you've always got the nuance. And one of the nuances is also Mark, that Apple doesn't really want us talking about these numbers anyway. They want us to think about the subscriptions. They want us to think about overall direction of travel rather than the intricacies of how many iPhones they sell. But on the top end or the bottom end, what's more important? Are they still really a luxury item that can charge us more? 
You, you know, I think it's interesting. Apple made a change, I believe it was five years ago now, four or five years ago now, where they stopped reporting unit sales uh, for their individual products like the iPhone, the iPad, etc., and they moved to revenue only. Now, at the time, they did that because unit sales were slowing, right? So in terms of overall units, those were going down in terms of how many they were selling. Uh, but at the same time, revenue was going up because of the price increases, right? So they do want us to focus on the revenue because that is what is increasing. And in terms of the devices being a luxury item, uh, I would say somewhat, right? Phone prices overall across the entire market have been going up. You're seeing a lot of Android phones, uh, Google phones getting in that pricing uh, tier. Apple at this point doesn't even sell the most expensive phone in the market. Those would be the foldable phones sold by Samsung, Google, and some of the Chinese players. Uh, but I think Apple will get there, right, if they're continuing to increase storage, add new camera capabilities. Uh, next year actually is going to be another iPhone upgrade of note. They're going to increase the screen sizes uh, marginally, right? That could add some pricing pressure there as well. Uh, so clearly I would say they're a luxury item, but they're not at the very, very high end, but they'll get there. Mark Gurman, we thank you for breaking down what is the key story because it is the most valuable company, more than $3 trillion currently being added at the moment to its market cap. 3.037 is where we stand. And remember, look, Apple is not going to give us its earnings, its juicy details until next week, August the 3rd. But boy, have we got a lot to be digesting this week. Alphabet, Snap, Microsoft, mega names, mega about a market capitalization going to be coming through with transparency as to whether they live up to those valuations. Let's get it to it with Liz Young, therefore, head of investment strategy over at SoFi. It's a big week, and it feels as though all eyes on some of these AI-focused names, the Microsofts and, indeed, the Alphabets. Yeah, it's a huge week, Fed week and all of these earnings coming in. It's really feeling like this is when the rubber hits the road. For a lot of these companies that have seen so much optimism and multiple expansion so far in 2023, the commentary out of earnings is going to be hugely important because if you look ahead to the end of 2023 and into 2024, earnings expectations are pretty high just across the board for the index. So companies are going to have to be able to justify the multiples that these stocks are trading at with their own expectations of what the next 12 months look like. So it's going to be a really sticky situation if they can't justify that. Some of the AI enthusiasm, my concern has been that when you have a new theme and a new innovation that is supposed to take the world by storm or just even change the marketplace a little bit, themes usually take two to three years to really materialize and they go through a price discovery phase along the way. So I'm not sure that we're going to get justification and gratification of this AI theme in the next six to 12 months. And that's something that these companies will have to grapple with in the market. I'm just thinking about price discovery. It was last week that Microsoft got a push higher in terms of its record market cap for itself because, well, they're starting to outline how they're going to price for some of the add-ons that we're getting with the Bing chat features. And it looked pretty toppy. People were impressed by the amount that they think they can charge. Ultimately, you've been impressed by the market capitalizations more broadly. Do you think that we have moved too far too fast? Can we hold on to the level of outperformance in tech stocks that we saw in the first half of the year? Well, when you've got an index like the NASDAQ 100 up 45% year to date, that's an outlier as far as performance goes. And, and I would say it's probably due for a little bit of steam coming out just because of how quickly things have run up. Expectations haven't changed too much from a fundamental perspective. So when you see that big dislocation, not only among different sized companies, so you've got large caps that really outpaced small caps, mm -hmm. maybe until just recently. And when you've got certain sectors that handily outpaced other sectors, there usually is a little bit of mean reversion or just kind of closing that gap. Those big divergences don't last forever. So they do need to come back to a more rational place. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to come crashing down. There's still an argument to be had, which a lot of the bulls will tell you, which is that the rest of the market can catch up rather than those big names having to come down. That being said, given the environment, given that we are on the precipice of what's expected to be another Fed hike, it just doesn't quite make sense, especially for those what we would call long duration equities to be trading at such lofty valuations when we haven't really finished the tightening cycle yet. Usually the market hits the skids a little bit when mm. that tightening cycle stops. Of course, today was the day we we're meant to see the Nasdaq 100 rebalancing, it's occurred, maybe a little bit of volatility in the run-up, but did it make 
much changes for you? Do you think ultimately the Nasdaq 100 is a benchmark that can really be used for diversification? Uh, I think it can be used. I mean, I don't know that it's something that necessarily is the epitome of diversification, mm -hmm. given how top heavy it becomes at certain times. But that's just the nature of a market cap weighted index. The rebalancing, the actual day of rebalancing, obviously isn't having too much of an effect. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that probably got baked in when the announcement was made. You can extrapolate what's going to happen. But over time, as things change and as prices move, that's just always going to be the case with a market cap weighted index, which is why sometimes it becomes more of a risk not to own some of those names because you're underexposed to what's really driving broad markets and driving investor sentiment. Yeah, a lot of those actively managed mutual funds have been under pressure, according to the likes of Goldman Sachs. Lastly, is I mean, what about protection? If you are worried that we've gone too far too fast, is it in any way, well, advantageous to be protecting the downside right now? Sure. Well, you know, I've been one of those people who was skeptical of this rally all the way up and uh, have felt very, very wrong all the way up. But that being said, it is always good to have protection in the portfolio. I would say it's even better to have it in the portfolio when you have valuations above the 5, 10, and 15-year averages. And when you have a VIX that seems pretty asleep at the wheel, that's when it's kind of primed to spike. So although it feels like a ball and chain, it can feel like cement boots to put protection in the portfolio in the midst of a rally, that's really the time when protection is going to pay off more because maybe it's not under such strong demand. You can get it at a cheaper price and then it's there if and when you need it. Helps you sleep a bit better maybe. Liz Young, a so That's far. Right. <laughs> get some rest ahead of what is going to be a monumental week. We thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Meanwhile, let's talk about what happened overnight over at Twitter that is now X. Elon Musk's vision of the everything app is getting closer and closer because look, the logo has just changed to a stylized X that you see on your screens. And it all happened over the space of 24 hours. Late on Saturday, Musk invited his, what, almost 150 million followers to suggest an actual logo, crowdsourcing it. He then chose one and made it the company's new brand identity. For the meantime, it went up on Sunday. Now, the social platform's homepage logo as well, his profile photo, even part of the loading animations. We're going to discuss so much more about what the CEO, Linda Yaccarino, has had to say about it all later in the hour. But first, coming up, we've got to discuss Look, AI, which X is meant to be developing a little bit more. What about the development of it here in the US? Several AI giants have committed to safety standards across the technology, including Anthropic. The co-founder is going to be joining us and president, that's Daniela Amodi. This is Bloomberg Technology. At the end of last week, we saw that seven leading AI companies in the United States agreed to voluntary safeguards on the new technology's development. Amazon, Anthropic, Google, Inflection, Meta, Microsoft, OpenAI, all formally making their commitment to new standards for safety, for security, and as well as trust. It was at a meeting with President Biden at the White House on Friday afternoon. Now, the Biden administration has really been vowing to manage the risks of new tools, even as they compete over the potential of artificial intelligence. Joining us now, I'm pleased to say, as someone who was at the meeting, been thinking about safety for a long time, Anthropic president and co-founder, Daniela Amode. And Daniela, these safeguards, voluntary as they are, a step in the right direction for you? Uh, hi, first of all, thank you so much for having me here on the program today. And yes, we were very uh, grateful to be invited to the conversation at the White House on Friday. Uh, our CEO, Dario, my brother was there and had the opportunity to speak with uh, the president and with the other uh, industry leaders. And yes, you know, I think this is an incredible first step towards really making sure that we are working together uh, at the industry level, with government, with civil society, in thinking about how to develop these systems in ways that are safe, that are secure, that are trustworthy. And so we were very happy to be part of that conversation on Friday. Of course, many have sort of tried to understand how really authentic some leaders in AI are about sort of being regulated, about being overseen. How deeply do you think that runs when actually everyone's also just trying to race to ensure that they're the first to innovate? 
You know, I think that these two things, uh, you know, really don't have to be uh, intention. And one of the things that I think Anthropic has has really sort of uh, built kind of our our ideas around is this concept that you can develop these very transformative systems in ways that are robustly safe. Uh, with the launch of Claude 2 that we had, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, one of the things we really emphasized and focused on was sort of this commitment to making the models, you know, as safe as possible mm -hmm. and really working to improve on things like uh, helpfulness, honesty, and harmlessness. And so I think this kind of industry discussion as a whole around how to, you know, move forward with, with this innovative technology, but also really ensure that it's done in a way that is, you know, safe and secure is, is so important. Claude 2, of course, is meant to be less susceptible to manipulation than other chatbots. You really are thinking about safety, kindness, but how? How do you go about building that into a model? Yes. So, you know, of course, no, you know, no model on the market is 100 uh, percent, you know, immune from, you know, jailbreaks or is perfectly safe. But really, our goal has been to try and provide a model that's as safe as possible today. And we do that through, you know, a few different techniques. Uh, one of them is something called constitutional AI. And this is really a process of training the model uh, with kind of guidelines around how to be, you know, safe and, and helpful to users, uh, really trying to maximize the, the honesty and also harmlessness of the model. So making sure it doesn't output, you know, negative bias. Uh, toxic content or, you know, making it harder to, uh, you know, assist a human in, in doing harm. You've, of course, taken your time in releasing product updates. Has that in any way been a tension with your own backers? You've raised a lot of money. If people wanted you to be faster or if they understood that time is necessary if you're going to be focused on safety? So again, you know, I really think of this as kind of, you know, a, a balancing act, right? We have had Claude internally and we've been using it and mm. testing it for some time. And we also really just wanted to make sure that the, the model that we were putting out onto the market, right, that Claude.ai uh, was as safe as possible, right? So that when not just businesses, but individuals are kind of signing up to play around with it, that, uh, you know, it's it's hopefully, you know, as safe as possible and certainly safer than, you know, Claude 1, uh, you know, our previous model that was on the market. And meanwhile, being able to analyze, summarize vast quantities of information, give us the productivity gains that we're all looking for. I'm interested as to when you're thinking about developing not only the models internally, but doing them safely and within future regulation. How do you look at what Europe's up to in terms of trying to set the rules of the road? Yeah, so, you know, I think this is a really, again, kind of important conversation that we have been having, uh, you know, both with uh, U.S. policymakers and future regulators, uh, but really abroad as well, right? I think so much of what we've seen uh, in the past, you know, six to 12 months is that artificial intelligence is becoming this kind of worldwide phenomenon, right? It's not just something that's the province of, you know, a specific country or countries. And so I think obviously the conversations that are having, you know, here, uh, but also in the EU are just incredibly important from a data privacy and, uh, you know, security and safety perspective perspective and a conversation, you know, we've really been actively a part of as well. Of course, prior to Anthropic and helping co-found it, you were at OpenAI, you were also at Stripe as a risk manager. How do you compare the way in which regulation is top of mind for the focus on AI vis-a-vis -vis fintech, vis-a-vis, -vis, I mean, we all think about the blow up of crypto, for example. Yeah, I mean, I really think that this, uh, really just this concept that I kind of come back to around this kind of public-private um, kind of partnership or, you know, communication norms, I think are just incredibly uh, important. And I think that those are, you know, some of the lessons learned from kind of previous industries, right, is really having, uh, you know, communication early and often, right? Mm -hmm. I think at Anthropic, we view part of our role in the industry as uh, helping to give, you know, policymakers and civil society and academics uh, access to our information, right? So we've published more than 15 safety papers. Uh, anyone can read them on our website. And uh, we develop policy briefings because we really, you know, view this as, as part of our role, right? Is helping to inform people more broadly about, you know, potential safety, safety topics and questions. Daniela Amade. Great to have some time with you. Thank you, Anthropic President and indeed co-founder, whose brother had been there at the meeting with the White House on Friday. Meanwhile, coming up.
Barbenheimer, was that your weekend? Well, it was many people's weekend. It sent shockwaves through the box office. And we got all the numbers for you next. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology. Talk about what was hot this weekend. Movies, apparently. Barbie, Oppenheimer brought out movie fans in their droves, making this weekend's box office revenue more than double from a year ago. Joining us really about the business uplift from Barbenheimer, Bloomberg Intelligence's Geetha Raghunathan. And Geetha, I mean, wow, Warner Brothers must be pleased. So too must be some of the cinema chains, Cineworld and AMC. But ultimately, is this as amazing as it seems to be? It's absolutely amazing. It's unprecedented. I mean, you know, this kind of foot traffic, Caroline, is something that you would reserve for, let's say, a Marvel or a Star Wars kind of a phenomenon, right? And then to have two movies like this, which which are really polar opposites, mm. you know, it's such a fantastic, clever piece of counter-programming that both these studios kind of put together on the same date. And the fact that they were able to kind of tap into this whole social, you know, cultural, like it, it really kind of became this pop culture moment. And they both tapped into it so aggressively and so beautifully it, en it ended up boosting the box office for both movies and just it it's just created this whole positive, upbeat conversation now for the industry, which, which has come really at such an opportune moment, I think. I mean, considering that the entire conversation around the industry was about writer strikes, about acting strikes, how much is that going to be a concern going forward or can they reap the rewards of the production that's available to be distributed now? Yeah, so as we came into this summer box office season, you know, obviously there was a lot more content. So last year, what we were kind of looking at was there was just not enough content out in the theaters. People were willing to come. The demand was there, but the supply wasn't. And this year we have 30% higher, so 30% more titles versus last year. But we saw that a lot of these, even high profile titles, right, whether you looked at an Indiana Jones or Elemental, uh, you know, The Flash, all of these kind of underperformed. They didn't live up to expectations. And so that kind of brought us back to this question about, you know, can we ever go back to pre-pandemic levels? And then add to that the added complexity from the writer strike and, you know, the actor strike that's kind of shut down production. Mm. I don't think we're necessarily going to see anything, uh, any major delays as far as 2023 is concerned. But then you get into 2024 and 2025 and things start to look a little bit hazy because, you know, a lot of the titles that we were expecting to come out then now could be pushed back. Keep a keen eye on some of those other stocks that you're looking at, AMC, therefore, on the back of this. But we always love all your analysis across all the stocks you watch. Geetha Raganath and, of course, of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, coming up, we'll talk about the debate around the viability of blockchain's utility. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde. Right here in New York, let's check in on these markets because actually the rebalancing has occurred. The Nasdaq 100 meant to be taking away some of that overall well, dominance of the key five, six, seven players that have so rode the wave of AI euphoria this year. We see it just gaining about a tenth of a percent as that comes to an end, the overall rebalancing. Many have traded ahead of that as to whether we see a downplay in the likes of Meta, NVIDIA and some of the stocks that are really outperformed this year. But the all-country world index managing to stay afloat up three tenths of a percent, even though we saw some pretty ugly data, PMI data coming out of Europe in particular, just showing that maybe these central banks are going to have to look at the tension between growth and interest rate hikes that much more as inflation still on the eyes of the ECB in particular. But remember, they've got to be able to support the economy too. Bitcoin on the downside, 3.5% lower. Maybe no real catalyst here, just a lack of clarity as to whether or not we do get some of those spot Bitcoin ETFs coming to the market and indeed where regulation goes. Let's move it on to the individual names that are moving this market because Apple is really helping support the likes of the Nasdaq 100 and indeed the benchmarks today, up 6 tenths percent, most valuable stock. Why? Well, they're likely to be selling, well, 85 million, as we understand how many phones they want to be made for the next um, upcoming iPhone 15. So actually, people thinking that looks pretty strong, given the overall economic environment. NVIDIA on the upside, Mizuhu going long this stock, saying really there's still opportunity to buy, despite the significant outperformance of this chip stock and all eyes on AI. Remember, we've got a bit of time to wait for their earnings later in August. Gilead Sciences, your worst performer, really, on major benchmarks today, off by 4.5%. Sadly, 
HR high-risk MDS is something that they're not going to be able to be combat combating with a really cocktail of some of their drugs. They were doing some testing. The phase three is having to be wound down. We're off by 4.5%. Let's go back, though, to the crypto news. I was just looking at Bitcoin under pressure. And look, it's three years and multiple digital asset market dislocations, hundreds of millions of dollars. But an eyeball-scanning crypto project, known as WorldCoin, is officially launched. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines. And what's so interesting about this project is it's kind of managing to be that perfect hype of AI and crypto and indeed Sam Altman too. Yeah, exactly. Spearheaded by Sam Altman, who has in many ways become synonymous with AI, Caroline. And you're right to point out just how long this took. Since Bloomberg first reported about this project back in June of 2021, Bitcoin has gone from around $32,000 up to $67,000, back down to $30,000. So there's been a lot of change uh, leading up to this debut. But what a debut it has been. The initial price, Caroline, for this token was $1.70. Currently, according to pricing on CoinMarketCap.com, we're at $2.20. So that's up roughly 37% on this day. About 143 million coins have been allocated in this launch. And this is very much about the fervor around AI. There's this bridge between AI and crypto is what WorldCoin does is it has this small device called an orb, which scans the eyeball of an individual and creates a digital identity, giving that person what this company is calling proof of personhood. They essentially build this as essential in a world where it's very hard to tell what is generated in terms of content by a human and what is not, what is generated by AI. So clearly you are seeing some of that excitement showing up in the price action today. It is worth noting, though, that this can't be traded everywhere. It cannot be traded currently here in the U.S. because of the regulatory environment. And Sam Altman spoke to Bloomberg about this, about the uncertainty around regulations here in the U.S. He told Bloomberg that he hopes the U.S. will be able to get to a, quote, rational place in terms of crypto regulation. So limited here as to how you can interact with WorldCoin, but seri cons consider it elsewhere, uh, it seems to be getting quite the reception. Kaylee, brilliant as always. We thank you, of course, the co-host of Bloomberg's crypto show, so she knows a fair thing or two about the overall speculation of this market or hype and reality. Let's stick with that and indeed some of the overall use cases. That's what everyone has wanted. Identity being a key one for WorldCoin. What about blockchain? How do they remain that underlying technology relevant and the applications? Well, there's a tool to check it out. It's called The Value Proposition. It's a website database demonstrating the positive impact, they say, of blockchain applications on any network. The website is powered by Polygon Labs and launched just over about a month ago. Let's bring in Polygon's chief legal and policy officer, Rebecca Rettig. It is great to have some time with you, Rebecca. And interesting that we're just talking about identity as a key area that blockchain technology can be a real use case. Just tell us a little bit about the value prop and um, the other opportunities we're seeing blockchain technology be applied and used. Thanks so much. Um, the Value Prop is an interactive website that allows you to go in and see all of the positive use cases for blockchain. It answers the question, as you said, is there a fundamental value to blockchain? We've seen it asked by the White House, by reporters, by policymakers around the world. And this interactive website is really meant to answer the question in the affirmative, yes. Uh, so it showcases things from as you said, identity with WorldCoin that's on the value prop, but also things that we've seen from Starbucks and other, and uh, Sports Illustrated and other major companies that have launched blockchain-based applications as well. Yeah, we're looking at some of those companies now. Starbucks, you mentioned, Disney, Coca-Cola, Nike, even, well, charitable donor elements like UNICEF. What is perhaps the, is it all about financial applications? Is this about loyalty? What are you really seeing companies' willingness to embrace at the moment the world of Web3 when it hasn't exactly been loved from a regulatory perspective? Um, I think finance is one part of blockchain and it's gotten a lot of attention, but there are 42 disparate use cases on the value prop that, that range from consumer loyalty to identity to gaming um, to social impacts. And there are over 430 applications that fall within those 42 different use cases. So I think what we're going to see as we continue on this blockchain journey is something that expands well beyond the finance use case into things uh, like democratizing all of the ways we use the internet, such as social media, consumer loyalty, uh, and even something like the California DMV government is looking at ways to use blockchain-based applications as well. Okay, let's look about the government a little bit, because you, of course, the reason 
Polygon is there and the use case in many ways is about building the infrastructure of Web3, making it easier, faster, cheaper to be transacting on Ethereum in particular. How much are you seeing your own use case being, well, elevated at the moment? Are we stagnating in any way? I do think that the infrastructure and the scaling infrastructure in particular is really getting a lot of attention and uh, in terms of making blockchains much more available and widespread and faster, cheaper, easier to use. Ours is not a use case in particular. As you said, it's just the infrastructure that allows all of these various use cases to be built on top in an open and permissionless way and democratizes all the ways that the internet is being used, whether it's by governments or by people through consumer loyalty programs as well. Your token, Matic. Well, the SEC's decided that perhaps it is a security. How have you managed to deal with that? I know you've recently taken on the legal part of the role that you now have on top of policy. How are the conversations going? Um, well, the Matic allegations were in allegations against Binance and Coinbase, two third parties, uh, which, which we have no affiliation. And um, those cases are progressing forward. But more than that, I do uh, sort of echo what Mr. Altman said, which is, I hope, especially given what we've seen as to different types of decisions coming out of U.S. district federal courts um, about the ways that crypto can be used. I hope we do have sensible regulation that really brings clarity and allows businesses in the U.S. to continue doing business um, and get back to the business of doing business as well. Do you remain committed to the U.S.? Do you think there's this talk of talent moving overseas? Uh, so Polygon Labs is an international company, mm. but I do think that people view the in the people in the crypto space in general view the U.S. as a particularly important place and a place where technology has really thrived for a long time. And I think that many in the industry are really committed to seeing legislation move forward that puts really safe guardrails uh, around the industry and the way that users interact both with technology and with tokens as well. Other countries around the world have already done that. The EU has had Mika in place now for a few months, and uh, there are rules and regs being built out by the European Banking Authority and by ESMA, which is the, the Securities Authority, to really implement Mika in a practical way. The UK has put out a very compelling crypto asset consultation about building a regulatory regime there. And other countries around the world have had crypto regulations in place, particularly for these centralized exchanges, for many years. So I do hope and think that people are hopeful that the US, as it's long been a tech center, really catches up and takes the same type of approach. And I'm sure, in many ways, this is exactly why the volume value prop has been put forward is to try to discuss that this isn't just always speculation, but this is actually real tangible use cases of the underlying technology. How much do you think that that's the fight that you have to have? Or is it better if we start to see the Larry Finks, the, the other key players in this world start to push for Bitcoin spot ETFs than like that will actually change hearts and minds? Well, I think the value prop is really something that can change hearts and minds because it really allows people to go in and search by use case and the things they care about the most and see how blockchain is powering that in a very positive way. But I think this is a group effort that I do hope that Larry Fink and others in the traditional financial world who are really coming around to the compelling use case that Bitcoin and other types of crypto assets may have. They're an important voice. And for people who've been working in the industry behind the scenes as builders and lawyers and um, uh, others who believe in this technology, there's an important voice there as well. So I do hope that this is a group effort over time for the value proposition of blockchain to really come to the fore. Well, thanks for being the voice on this show today, Rebecca Retti. We appreciate it. Polygon Chief Legal and Policy Officer. We thank her. Meanwhile, coming up, let's talk about, well, what has been a well and true slump in M&A. Of course, in many ways, spearheaded by a collapse of Credit Suisse or some of the concerns and agitations within the banking sector, interest rates more broadly. What is it doing for Wall Street giants? What does it mean for your technology companies in the venture back space actually eventually going public? More on that next. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Time now for Talking Tech. First up, Alibaba has decided not to sell any part of its one-third stake in Ant during the Chinese fintech leader's imminent share buyback. The e-commerce company says it wants to maintain its slice of an important partner. It won't take part in Ant's plan to buy back as much as 7.6% of its stock, while others are indeed selling out. Meanwhile, SoftBank is setting up an AI-powered warehousing joint venture with Symbotic. Both companies are investing a combined $100 million to establish the deal, which will be called Greenbox Systems LLC. Plus, Tesla delivered more electric vehicles in the first half of this year than Volkswagen, BMW and Mercedes-Benz combined. German car makers are struggling as software issues delay key models and contribute to waning sales, particularly in China. Meanwhile, let's talk more broadly about risk-taking in this sector because high borrowing costs, geopolitical tensions and, well, the threat of a global recession, just some of the factors that have led to a slump in mergers and acquisitions. In turn, Wall Street titans have kind of reshuffled their M&A leadership this year. Some firms have gone on a hiring spree, while others are still there hoping that M&A boom cycle is just around the corner. It's a great story. It's today's big take. And Bloomberg's Crystal C is one of the reporters behind it. And I hadn't thought about this angle, that even though M&A is kind of felt on ice, even though we keep talking about Microsoft and Activision, Basically, people are all moving decks at the moment. Why? Why are bankers moving? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what you're seeing, like Microsoft Activision, it indicates like a high regulatory hurdle when it comes to deal making, right? So and what that really means is that it takes much longer for deals to close and the bonus doesn't really hit that <laughs> year you do that deal. So a lot of people are moving around trying to pick up guarantee packages to see if they can get a one year guarantee or like a second year on an earn out to see if that can subsidize some of their income. And that obviously isn't the main reason. The main reason is the Credit Suisse UBS merger that really left so many bankers trying to find jobs all at the same time. And coupled that with not so good M&A performances last year, like not very good bonus performances, that just all led to everyone wanting to get a new job and a new environment. You sort of talk about some of the regulatory concerns, and many have felt that it's a big tech regulatory concern, but is it more M&A more broadly? And what does that mean for, you know, the venture investors out there who are looking for some sort of exit because you used to cover IPOs and that's been pretty much shut too. Yeah, IPO has been non-existent for almost a year until pretty much this month, right? We are not seeing any like big boom of IPO coming either. But what you're describing in the regulatory hurdle really is an industry agnostic mm. issue. We're seeing that in consumer. You see uh, Albertsons Kroger running into problems. You're seeing in healthcare, Mgen Horizon Therapeutic is also in court. So you're seeing these issues everywhere. And for venture capital firms, it may not be immune either because you're seeing some private equity firms are being uh, looked at for antitrust issues. So all in all, regulation is a bigger problem in every single sector, and especially in tech. But then a few are moving thinking there'll be a pickup? What would be the catalyst to there being some sort of pickup in M&A? So some of the investment banks are thinking that if they can pick up talent right now, and when the boom comes back, they are well positioned for it. And we see a lot of newcomers in this market, actually, especially in the US, you're seeing some European comers, Santander, Elantra, are making big hires in the US, and with big prices as well. A lot of the Credit Suisse people actually moved over to a Santander as a Credit Suisse 2.0. Mm -hmm. And a lot, you see that, and you kind of wonder, what happened here because that had happened before with HSBC coming over, with like uh, Nomura coming over. So this is an interesting time and could history repeat itself? It very much could, but uh, we've not seen this kind of scale and this kind of um, scope of people moving around in a long time. This is a global story in nature. We were just hearing about Ant Financial and Alibaba. I mean, is that the sort of name that we need to see starting to kickstart at least some of the spin-offs, some of the activity. How, how much is this a US-European bank story or is this a global Asian bank story too? So the players in Asia are slightly different. I, when I was in Hong Kong, you see a lot of uh, Chinese banks being very, very active players in M&A and uh, equity fundraising. A lot of the IPO may have like a Morgan Stanley and Goldman at the very top, but they will have 10 uh, Chinese banks supporting the listing. So. It's a, it's a slightly different uh, player composition out there. Mm. But this particular story, I would say, describes more so what happens in Europe and in the US. 
you see that same similar like moving around musical chair out in Asia as well, but more so in places like asset management where foreign players are still more dominant. And if you need, if you're talking about like more relationship-based business out in Asia, it's very much still local players having that advantage. Truly global story. We thank you for it, Crystal C. She's been everywhere covering everything, and we thank her for it. Meanwhile, coming up, look, Twitter's blue bird logo. Bye. It's become an X, a black and white one. We'll have the details of Musk's latest change. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Uh, we discussed it earlier. Earlier, let's dig in. X going viral, being Twitter's new logo, of course, replacing the signature Bluebird as part of Elon Musk's vision of transforming what is a 17-year-old service into what well, is everything app. Here with more is Bloomberg's Asia Counts. And even though we knew back in April the holding company had been changed names, we knew the obsession with X, which started well, back when PayPal was first formed, it sort of fell overnight in the way that it occurred. It did in a lot of ways, right? Elon Musk sent a tweet and was saying, if I get a good logo for X, we're going to run with it starting tonight. So it did seem fast, although it's been a slow development. As you mentioned, they started adding more of the features. He's talked about it a lot. He's been really vocal. But now the bird logo is slowly disappearing. If you go on the site, you don't see the bird in the top left corner anymore. So it does feel pretty fast in that regard. Immediately, we sort of felt that even though his CTO and ch executive chairman, the CEO, Linda Yaccarino, getting on board, sort of supporting the change, trying to illustrate where the overall everything app goes. And it seems to be very much payments alongside what? Video, content, audio as well? All of those things, right? And, and we've seen some movement towards those things. Musk has been testing out live video a lot. We know that the Tucker Carlson show is on Twitter. So adding those capabilities to do longer form videos Audio, obviously, has, has always been a thing with Twitter Spaces. They've been doing more of those. Musk has been involved in a lot of those. And then he's talked a lot about payments. We haven't seen the full-fledged version of that yet, but even just thinking about subscriptions, how you can subscribe to people's tweets. Now they're paying creators uh, a share of ad revenue. So all of those things have been steps towards this vision, and we'll see what that sort of next step is to fully realize it. And it feels kind of shocking. But look, I mean, Facebook recently did it with Meta. We know that Google became Alphabet as a parent company as it tried to sort of diversify its moonshots a bit. This isn't unheard of, but what sort of brand damage can it do? How much are advertisers, or indeed consumers, users, going to be kind of upended by this? I mean, that's a good question. And, and even in the examples you mentioned, right, you go on Facebook and you still see that blue F, right? You still kind of see some of the branding there. But it almost feels like Twitter is moving away from even having the blue bird logo. And so I think that is a bit different. And look, it's a question, right? That's something that we're going to be asking people as we're having conversations this week is how much was the Twitter brand worth? And how much will they sort of lose in moving away from that? Now, you could argue that the rebranding is also a way to move away towards some of the challenges Twitter has faced over the past six, seven months in terms of the content and just the perception amongst advertisers. So it could be helpful in that regard. But I don't know. How, how much is the brand worth? It is something that we've all sort of known for so many years, even to tweet has become a verb. What happens to that if it's now X? There's all these sorts of questions that, that lay in front of it. Yeah, I mean, I think Elon was asked over the weekend, what is it if you retweet? Because are you re-Xing, kind of kissing? Exactly. I, I like to see an X as a kiss. But ultimately, are, you, are we starting to see it come to its fruition, particularly on the mobile app? Because I haven't seen much change there as much as the web, for example. Yeah, it's, it's not as much. Again, the top left, at least on desktop, you can see the X. If you go to Elon Musk's profile, you'll see it says he works for X, and X has you know the the page and the affiliates and all the employees and things like that. So there are there have been movements. It's not full fledged yet. We haven't gotten there, but I mean it's been pretty fast. I mean he's got a son called X, I think, along with a few other letters. He's got SpaceX. He loves X. So definitely, he does love it. <laughs> Can't take it away from him. Meanwhile, Asia counts. Brilliant. Thank you for synthesizing it all down for us. Meanwhile, look, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Do not forget to check out our podcast. Find it on the terminal. You can go online on Apple, Spotify, and iHeart. From New York, this is Bloomberg Technology.